Hello everyone, and welcome to our presentation for the Subsurface Utility Mapping Strategy Forum. Our topic today will be creating the 3D Infrastructure Digital Twin. My name is Joseph Halati, and I'm the President and Co-Founder of FlexModus. In today's presentation, I'll be covering the problems faced by the utility mapping industry, the changes needed to improve and deal with these problems, uh, the topic of democratization and how it can improve utility mapping, and then I will dive directly into the infrastructure digital twin, how one is created, and I'll provide you with an example of an infrastructure digital twin. We will then close out by talking about data sharing, aggregation, and access to infrastructure data. Just a little bit about uh, LuxModus to start with. We are a rapid high volume 3D mapping technology company based in Calgary, Alberta, but operating globally. We have designed a suite of hardware and software products that are enabling the infrastructure mapping industry to broaden its ability to collect detailed, high accurate 3D data um, from infrastructure, to small, infrastructure projects as small as distribution lines for natural gas in residential areas, all the way up to large diameter pipelines, power lines, uh, and long distance rail and road projects. Our goal is to make 3D mapping easy for anyone who needs to do it uh, outside of the traditional survey industry, allowing more projects to actually have detailed 3D mapping. And we believe that um, underground utility mapping is a great application for 3D technology, and that's one of the things we'll be discussing uh, today. The first problem we have in the utility mapping industry is the current way we collect uh, data. This is slowly changing, but predominantly, uh, we're still using survey methods and locating methods and 3D mapping or mapping methods that go back um, hundreds, if not thousands of years. The equipment may have changed, but the methodology is still the same. Very time and materials based, very manual and, and very uh, analog. And these methods uh, are slow to execute and they're also very slow to deliver the data that people actually want to use relative to the pace that we want to consume data these days. Being analog and manual, they're expensive, hazardous at times because people are outside wandering around, um, and they often interfere with construction schedules and the lives of the people in the communities that, uh, that they're mapping in. They also require very specialized equipment and, and expertise. The second problem is how we keep and connect data together for use by other parties. Um, locating data that we go out and collect every single day is, is not really retained. Uh, and it's regularly causing rework for people going back to the same location they were at just a few weeks ago uh, to locate for another project. Uh, most people in the industry are very, very familiar with this. And it just causes an unbelievable amount of schedule and cost expense that is simply not required. It also exposes people to more risk. Having to send people out to, to relocate or remap an area that was just done not too long ago is doubling the risk uh, that those people are exposed to. Secondly, uh, as mentioned, that the data, because the data is not retained or, or kept in easily accessible ways, um, we can't analyze or view that data very often, and it's not shared with other parties, hence the rework of recollecting it. Um, and because the data is not being retained and centrally managed um, at a global level or at a large scale level, uh, there's no real or, uh, opportunity for organic data enhancements or improvements. And, and by that, I mean, you know, uh, constantly uh, aggregating data sets together and recognizing, oh, some data from, you know, for overhead wires was collected. And we also have data from, you know, a water line collection. Um, having all that data of the, those different data sets all over the same area, though, can give inferences to other infrastructure that might also be in that area. So ultimately, really, the utility mapping industry needs some basic changes. Uh, we need to move away from the monopoly that exists right now in the mapping industry, where just a handful of companies are able to out, go out there and actually collect, uh, collect data. We need to uh, democratize this collection, meaning that way more people can collect this data, basically making it a crowdsourced uh, approach and have multiple creators or collectors providing this data. And that also distributes the responsibility for, uh, for collecting data as well. Um, the more distributed the responsibility is, the lower risk um, and the lower the cost of, uh, of failures will be. Uh, we also need to change the skill level required. Uh, with technology now, we should be able to make line locating, uh, but particularly utility mapping in general, very easy, very automated, um, and thus allowing more people uh, to be able to do it. That will, again, help to reduce the monopoly we have on 3D mapping. 
making data really easy to collect and having technology and using technology will lower the cost. Lowering the cost of collecting data and aggregating data will therefore um, allow more people to do it, again, reinforcing that multi-career approach. But because the data is inherently going to be lower cost, um, you know, and data, it will lower the cost of data retention, and that will encourage more people um, uh, to retain the data that they have uh, because the, the actual project cost of collecting the data is so low. So um, the budgets will allow for the, the cost of retaining that data. Uh, we also need to change the effort. This has been alluded to by just you know mentioning that we could use a lot more technology um, by using um, uh, easy to use technology um, uh, and and making it faster to collect data. Um, it'll be uh, a lot easier to collect data and it'll therefore be easier to leverage that data. Um, and if the data is um, more interoperable, uh, it'll be easier to analyze. So the overall effort for collecting and using the data needs to decrease. Um, and ultimately, and I'm sure a lot of people again uh, in this presentation will agree with this one, the data right now is still very siloed. Even though we have uh, pretty standardized formats, uh, we need more open data uh, formats and more open data schemas that are more easily populated and easier to understand. Uh, we need to make data more universally universally accessible, both to distribute data, both to, to contribute data. We've got company X goes out and collects data. It should be easy to go and upload that data into a central place. And then if it's easy to get data up there, it should also be easy to get data out. And the best way to do that would be through a web-based approach of, of data upload and, and overall data access. We believe uh, that uh, democratization is the real future of 3D infrastructure mapping. Uh, we'll always have the traditional uh, mapping companies, survey companies, lo line locating companies, uh, and asset owners going out and, and collecting their own data. But through crowdsourcing um, data from you know, per regular day-to-day -day permitting, uh, from people mapping for other um, reasons, uh, infrastructure projects and so forth, and aggregating all that data and distributing the collection of data, and then distributing the ability to access that data. Um, that is how uh, utility mapping will really come to the forefront and, and be in the same lines as its peers and in other infrastructure industries in terms of the quality and accessibility of the data that's out there. Well, we we are all familiar uh, with the problems of uh, infrastructure mapping the, and the accessibility of, of data. Uh, we talk about it all the time. Uh, well, what we really need to do is is, is get going and, and start really working hard on solving this problem. And that's really what the sur subsurface utility mapping uh, strategy forum is about: is really getting industry to the next level. And um, at LuxModus, we really like working with um, the, the team uh, and the and the volunteers. Um, at the Mapping Strategy Forum um, because of the motivation and the interest everybody has across different disciplines, across different companies of actually um, really trying to deal with this pro this problem. Um, the saying goes, that the best time to plant a tree is 40 years ago. Well, if you haven't do done that, the second best time to plant a tree is today. And, and that's where we're at. And that's one of the reasons that this um, this virtual um, forum is, is underway. Um, we think the best paradigm for for producing and capturing asset data is through collecting it all into an infrastructure digital twin. Uh, digital twins have um, made a lot of progress in in a variety of industries out there, um, and uh, and the adoption of the digital twin paradigm is is really uh, is really taking off. Uh, at LuxModus, we've been uh, involved in the Digital Twin Consortium uh, since it was founded, since uh, since day one, as the sticker says, um, and we still participate that in in that form in in that consortium uh, to constantly learn more about digital twins, how to adopt them, and we work with our customers um, to help them adopt the digital twin concept. Um, most importantly, uh, for the utility uh, mapping industry, um, it should be noted that creating a digital twin is way easier than it was even just a few, year, a few years ago. Uh, thanks to groups like the Digital Twin Consortium uh, and, of course, the plethora of consultants that are out there, um, getting an understanding how to create a digital twin and how to develop a digital twin paradigm for your organization or for your asset is way easier than it was before. And we'll get into that in a second. Um, 
But in terms of an infrastructure digital twin, we think the time is right for an infrastructure digital twin. And not just, you know, it can be just at the asset level for one particular comp company, but we believe it should be at a regional level. There's lots of cities and municipalities and, and regional governments around the world uh, that are beginning to develop uh, comprehensive digital twins of all of their physical infrastructure, buildings, roads, trees, power lines, subsurface utility, everything. And they're, and they're really pouring a lot of resources into it. And I think they're already beginning to, to to see the benefits from that. And we think that uh, Canada and the United States should start doing the same thing. Uh, and for us in the utility industry, um, we can do our part um, with, you, with the utility infrastructure. Uh, data collection costs are lower than they ever have been. There's clearly interest in stakeholders and governments to start dealing with infrastructure and utility uh, mapping problems, um, particularly to lower costs of strikes and, and the loss of life and so forth. Um, we now know a lot more about how to create data from other data sets using uh, different types of analysis and artificial intelligence to, to piece disparate data sets together to create a more comprehensive and robust pictures. And nowadays, storage and compute are essentially free. We tell that to our customers all the time at LuxModus, um, but we think that that's one of the things that could really help um, the utility industry create an infrastructure digital twin is the fact that storing tons of data in the, in the cloud is really inexpensive now and, and using Using AI and machine learning in the cloud is very, very inexpensive compared to, to, to just a few years ago. Uh, well, what is a digital twin? Well, uh, I have the um, uh, you know the breakdown of a digital twin right here on the screen, and you can find it at the Digital Twin Consortium uh, blog site uh, with the URL uh, at the bottom of this. Uh, at this slide, and we'll be happy to connect anyone to the Digital Twin Consortium that would like to learn more about it. Uh, but if you just Google Digital Twin Consortium and definitions or something like that, you will find a whole bunch of information about digital twins and, and how to get one started. Um, but for uh, the sake of this presentation and the infrastructure digital twin, there's really three things uh, I really want to leave you with. Um, first of all, um, a digital twin um, needs to result in effective action okay it's it's not just uh, to to have uh you know from a communication standpoint hey we're company x and we have a digital twin philosophy you actually have to do something okay the the purpose of having a digital twin is to result in effective action that improves your business okay um it needs to use real time and and historical data which you know is paramount to us in the utility mapping industry um and probably most importantly, um, it's going to be motivated by out outcomes. Similar to the, my first point, of, it's just not to say, hey, we have a digital twin philosophy. It's that you want to achieve something and you're going to identify certain outcomes um, that you want to achieve. And for us in the utility industry, it is to, to, to degree, decrease and, avert and basically eliminate um, uh, uh, strikes of utilities and the, and, the, and the death and injuries and costs that, that comes with it. That's our, that's our, primary, uh, our primary motivation. Uh, creating uh, an infrastructure digital twin. Um, this is just uh, my personal opinion um, of, of how we can do it. And uh, this is really a, a talking point for the audience. Uh, but this is um, how I envision it. Um, uh, uh, you know, one approach that I envision that we, we could take. It really involves uh, four parties, the, you know, in no particular order, the actual constructors um, that are going to use data, they're going to create data. Um, and on the job site, they're accountable for incidents. Right, so they are clearly a stakeholder in creating an infrastructure digital twin. Uh, there's the traditional stakeholders uh, of governments, municipalities, community associations, health and safety, and and, and the like. Um, and they need to provide support and funds for this process. And they also need to enforce the accountability. Um, so they're accountable for accountability. Uh, you know, we can have all the laws and fines and so forth we want, um, but if they're if they're just token fines and rules aren't really enforced. Um, then no process is going to be successful. So we need to do a better job as a society of holding those uh, people accountable for holding other people accountable. Okay, and we and we and there's various means to which we can do that. Uh, we also have the locators. We can also call the mappers. But anyone really in the industry of uh, of helping map um, the utilities, particularly underground uh, utility infrastructure, um, surveyors, 3D mappers, uh, NGOs. Um, People involved in projects, people involved in monitoring projects. There's a there's a whole bunch of people involved in that space, um, and they're clearly stakeholders as well. Uh, and then there's going to be the advocates, um, groups like this, the Utility Mapping Strategy Forum, um, 
uh, safety organizations and so forth. Um, they may be providing support and funds to process, um, but there, you know, there's also the, the kind of the separate group or the, the, the one activity at least of educating the public uh, defining and supporting processes to advise the governments. Governments come and chain, uh, come and go. Um, leaders of agencies come and uh, come and go. So we need groups of people. We need advocates out there that are going to hold uh, people to task uh, and provide that that ongoing education uh, component. Uh, a little bit about the infrastructure digital twin, um, just you know, captured on this slide. As I mentioned, the best time to plant a tree, if you haven't already, is is to do it now. Um, it will use uh, the historical and, and new data that's collected out there. We can't just say uh, from this point forward, we're going to collect all this data. There's still lots of data out there and opportunistically, uh, we can start incorporating that data. So every time, you know, we're going to work on a, pro uh, on a project in a particular area, yes, we can go out and, and locate data uh, and, and do some mapping, but we can also draw on the historical information too and, and leverage that. Uh, at a minimum, even if the map's out of date, the map might illustrate, the, the data, the drawing might illustrate why certain things were done at a certain time. And that's very valuable knowledge to an engineering team as well. Um, the data is going to have to be accessible. That, that's blatantly obvious, um, I think, to everyone. But it's got to be visually available so people can go and look at a map and you know figure out what's going on. But it's also got to be available from a database standpoint, particularly a relational database, so it can be queried and analyzed and improved on through time. Not just be a snapshot in time, but be a database that can be updated and related to other data sets. Uh, processes for, for collecting data and maintaining data must be must be simple so that um, we can break that barrier um, uh, of having just a specialized group of people involved in mapping. If we truly want to democratize it and get crowdsourcing uh, and just data from disparate data sets, uh, we, need a very, we need very simple processes to get data in, analyzed, uh, and maintained. Uh, my strong personal belief is that infrastructure mapping should be 3D. Even though most utilities in the ground are within just a couple of meters of the top of the ground um, and they're in pretty straightforward corridors compared to larger infrastructure, uh, I think that 3D component uh, is vital. Because part of uh, analyzing um, uh, three uh, uh, data and mapping is that uh, ancillary data that I that I mentioned. So if you have overhead power lines or overhead wires in an area and they come down the side of a pole into conduit below the ground, you know that 3D component of that. Hey, there's overhead wires and now all of a sudden they're down below ground uh, is very important uh, from an analysis standpoint and an automated mapping standpoint. Um, imagery of uh, utilities needs to be orientated imagery, not just uh, 2D satellite imagery or um, you know, spherical panoramas from a mobile mapping system, but having images that actually appear as panels in space looking downward um, and looking off to the side are very important from a relational database standpoint. So unlike Google Maps where you have to just constantly advance the little guy on the road and, and you can see the next little area, um, having orientated imagery uh, that is basically an imagery with both an X, Y, and Z as well as a Phi Beta Kappa um, value um, will allow you to do much more machine learning and AI to identify objects, automatically classify objects, um, and also just bring up the appropriate image of an area or of a particular asset if you query a database a certain way. Having orientated images uh, provides way, way more capability in rapidly querying databases. Uh, to that point about databases, though, of course, there's always the discussion of standard formats. Um, I will let the discussion of standard data formats uh, fall in the hands of, of database management people and, and, and Purist GIS people. Um, but the main point being is that by having very standardized formats, including format, uh, including uh, uh, storage formats and, and, and cloud formats, um, improves our ability to, to inexpensively use machine learning and artificial intelligence and, and do associative analysis of, of disparate data sets to make a, a larger, more conflated uh, data set. Uh, just a few um, examples of an infrastructure digital twin. This is a project we did in Illinois with a, a partner, uh, proving out um, proving out the capability or the value of an infrastructure digital twin. This is where high density lidar and ultra high resolution imagery as used was used on a very low, very small diameter uh, gas distribution uh, install. Um, you can see from the LiDAR um, that all of the local utilities, it's not the greatest imagery, image of, of a LiDAR data set in the world, but um, you can clearly see um, the ease at which uh, the LiDAR um, uh, produces a, um, a 3D representation of, of the infrastructure. Um, 
the, the, there's been considerable advancements in automated 3D mapping that most people would be aware of, particularly because advancements in the autonomous vehicle industry have trickled down to other parts of the of the GIS industry. Um, sensors, accuracy, and overall function functionality of, of imagery and, and LiDAR sensors uh, has skyrocketed in, in the last uh, several years, and the hardware and software are vastly easier to use and produce vastly better data. Uh, you can see from these ortho uh, images collected uh, from our system and the and the LiDAR uh, overlapped, uh, overlaid on it, the, the feature extraction that was automatically uh, completed to define top of pipe, top of ditch, uh, and actual uh, joints um, uh, in the pipe. A little bit more about that. Uh, so here's just some automated classification uh, of the LiDAR. Um, having having this capability removes the need for someone to go out there with a pogo stick and, and find the top of pipe. So just by quickly scanning and driving by and scanning it with a mobile system, um, uh, you can produce a, basically a, a detailed 3D model, model at centimeter accuracy without having a person there for for tens of minutes or, or even hours to, to, to map an asset. So drastically reducing cost and making the collection way safer. Uh, we prefer mobile mapping systems as opposed to handhelds because handheld systems don't really end up saving you that much more time because, and because of the time required to, to register the image sets and so forth. Um, and mobile mapping systems um, produce a tremendous amount more data uh, and its registration it, it tends to be vastly uh, superior. Um, and um, uh, and it eliminates the need for someone to get out of a vehicle. Anytime you're still getting out, whether you're using handhold hand, hand laser, handhold mapping system or a pogo stick, you still have a person outside the vehicle walking around a neighborhood or walking around a street. Um, so with a mobile system, uh, you eliminate that, uh, you eliminate that risk. And you also drastically decrease the time required to do the collection. Um, again, so just on that same, um, asset, uh, you can see, um, uh, automated feature extraction was used and you can see the the electrofused coupling you can see the butt joints you can see the t's and so forth um, all this can be done pretty simply now uh, with automated feature extraction um, moving on to to data access you know um, uh, databases and everything around data a topic loved by many and hated by many equally uh, but database data management and designing standards around data um, it is really uh, key to having an infrastructure digital twin and for this very topic of um, utility mapping and the strategy we're going to have to improve uh, utility mapping uh, in the Western world. Um, the first step of really for creating infrastructure digital twin with re related to data access is making all of the data accessible. Okay, the historical data, the new data, and, and breaking down these silos. Okay, um, and this will include um, putting uh, complex uh, data sets together um, and also very simple data sets together. Um, by bringing various data sets together, even if they're not directly in the completely exactly the same database, but they can be re easily related together, there's a lot of analysis you can do to fill in the gaps. Um, and as I say, putting two and two together, hey, there's a fire hydrant over there. Um, and there's on this map, there's no line for fire hydrant. There's another fire hydrant down there. Well, there's gotta be a water line somewhere for these fire hydrants, right? So clearly the map is incomplete. So, you know, just being able to, you know, heuristically and using topological rules, identify gaps and errors and, and use those same rules uh, to fill in those gaps are gonna drastically improve um, our mapping. So when people do go to the field to do the final updated map, they're, they're going empowered and they're just not starting from scratch. Um, the temporal component is very important to infrastructure mapping um, and that I don't think is very well accounted for in, in, cur in most current uh, databases. Um, also, I think the need for all infrastructure data uh, is required for utility mapping and the infrastructure digital twin uh, because you know having the information of the footprint of a building the height of fences where piles are built and, and bullards on, and so forth are also all very valuable uh, for correcting uh, and updating infrastructure data I can't tell you how many times I've seen a map of underground conduit or underground wires um, and you know they're clearly running intersecting with um, the pile for a building or the base of a pole or a bullard or something like that where clearly those lines are not there. They should be you know, a foot to the left or a foot to the right or even five meters to the left. Um, so by having more infrastructure information, we can clearly identify the errors and gaps uh, in our data. Um, 
Aggregating digital twins, uh, I kind of just touched on this, uh, but it really is the second step and that's why it's a separate slide. Um, and it's part of our need to share for all infrastructure data. So um, when you're, you know, it's, again, as it says, it's not just for buried utilities. Um, if we bring in infrastructure information, especially about projects, um, that will really help, I think, in utility mapping. So bringing in every time permits are struck or, or projects are developed, um, having that information available is going to help our mapping needs. So how many times uh, have you been involved in a project that for your project, you went out and did utility mapping and then you kind of did your work and two weeks later, another project came along and just redid the utility mapping. By having information of what projects are going to be going on in the area, we can drastically reduce the cost of just the, the you know, the mapping and updating the data and maintaining that data. Um, but inherently, we're also going to save money on daylighting um, and, and those other activities related to mapping and maintenance and updating uh, of utilities. Um, in, the, in the military, you know, uh, they, they say, uh, you have to maximize concurrent activity. That is, don't have your troops just sitting around doing nothing. There's always work that can be done. Um, and knowing what work needs to be done in the future, you can start preparing that um, right away. And I think by understanding and drawing in the permitting process and the project development process um, into the mapping industry and the, and the demands for mapping, the schedule for mapping, we can drastically uh, decrease cost and find a lot of schedule uh, efficiencies. In summary, um, to bring the presentation to a close, uh, what we covered here uh, is the main problems, uh, the two main problems facing the utility mapping industry. That is the current methods we use and our inability to, uh, to retain data and make it available to other people. Uh, and that drives the need for, for change in the industry. We need to make mapping cheaper, faster, and generally better for the whole industry to um, make sure that we have more, make sure we're able to empower more people uh, to collect data than just the current people that that do it and to bring in other data sets um, and you know by doing that we will will decrease the cost and we'll increase the turnaround of what we have for data sets and ultimately um, you know as the third point brings about uh, we will help to democratize uh, 3d mapping um, we can you know rapidly crowdsource uh, a lot of information. I don't mean crowdsource of, hey, what's the latest, the, the best restaurant today, but I mean, there's all these different groups uh, on projects, all these different stakeholders, all these different particip participants that all actually have some information about a project. And all those little bits of information ultimately do impact utility and infrastructure uh, mapping. Uh, I provided a overview of the infrastructure digital twin, and uh, I encourage everyone to go look at the digital twin consortium to learn more about digital twins and how one can uh, start to bring about one uh, for their assets, for their organization, um, or just personally even adopt a kind of a digital twin philosophy of a holistic approach to data and maintaining that information through time. Uh, we gave an example of directly creating an infrastructure digital twin. Um, you know, the four, the four actors needed to participate in, you know, that is the constructors, the advocates, um, uh, the, the, the locators, um, and, and basically the government um, and, and them working together, um, not in individual groups, but working together to, to create and facilitate digital twin, infrastructure digital twins going forward. Uh, I quickly provided some examples of existing infrastructure digital twins um, and then talked about the importance of data sharing and aggregation. So thank you again for participating uh, in this presentation and, 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 and sitting through it. Uh, my name is Joseph Halati. Uh, I'm the president of LuxModus and I can be reached at joseph at luxmodus.com if you have any questions. Um, and we look forward to hearing any questions you have um, at the end of the presentation. Hi there. Joseph, what a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much for that. Uh, two comments. One, uh, I really enjoyed your, uh, your presentation. It was very insightful. And uh, I love the comments about it's never too late to plant the seed, democratizing the data, keeping it simple, and understanding what your requirements and motivations are. So great points. I like that. Now, we do have a question. Have you shared your presentation with the US 811 system? So the one call systems of the US. Uh, no, I haven't. I, uh, first of all, thanks everyone for, again for seeing through the uh, presentation and for the opportunity to um, speak uh, at the at the forum. But uh, no, I haven't had the opportunity to do that. Uh, if someone has a connection there or a way which we can communicate there, we, we'd love that opportunity to, to speak with them about it. Perfect. And just so everybody is aware, uh, Joseph and I are working with a bunch of other folks on putting uh, an initiative together to do that uh, data collection, if you will, and uh, 
creating accurate res records, making them available for a digital twin. So again, thanks very much, Joseph. Really appreciate it. Look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you very much, Steve. Take care.